Here, let me show you. It means to note a prophecy. To note a prophecy. See that? He that keepeth my word. You know, the main definition, he that watches it. Who, he that guards it from loss or injury by keeping the, the eye upon it. So whoever is taking notes and watching his word and, you know, Jesus says something and you, you take his word. See, and this began to happen to me a lot now after this experience. See, now I told you about the time when I saw him at the gate, you know, with his apostles, I noticed he was much different than what I've seen in the churches. But after this time, I mean, he imprinted himself in, on me. I remember for weeks, when I closed my eyes, I would see his face like, like an imprint. <laughs> and I told y'all before, I was, I was walking around saying, love and perfection, love and perfection. <laughs> Because it was so strong, you know. I remember standing in front of my house. I'm like, blood. <laughs> you see, and you, you begin to realize when you see Jesus. See, he says, when you're a friend to me, you, when you keep my word, he it is that's a friend to me. So when you begin to keep his word more than anything. Mm. See, and then <clears throat> I begin to see more clearly like a lot of stuff I was hearing in the church world was sometimes contradictory to his word or exaggerated in some way mm. or just flesh. You know, someone talking about a flesh trying to hype stuff up and trying to use the word to fit what they're trying to do or say. See, but Jesus said he that guards my word. See, Jesus is looking for people that will be loyal to him above all else. Loyal to what he said. It don't matter if, if something's contradictory, it don't matter who it's coming from. It could come from the Pope. It could come from any bishop, you know, of any church. It, it could come from anything. If it's not what Jesus is saying, or if they're not showing the character of Jesus, that's when you just cling to Jesus and say, and, you know, you might not understand it all, you know. And so this is what you go through when you start getting closer to Jesus, but you notice so much contrary stuff, and you just keep clinging to his word. That's what he's talking about. You're keeping his word. You see his word where he says, don't desire the chief seats in the synagogue. The hypocrites desire that. You see what I'm saying? But then you see people that build like a big throne for themselves to sit on in the churches. You see what I'm saying? See, but when you read what Jesus said, you know, this is just one example. Jesus said, be humble. Don't desire the chief seats. Amen. So in building the church now, having the mind of Christ, that's why we don't have no big throne up here for me to sit down, you know. Amen. Cross my legs and look at everybody like, a, like I'm important, you know. Amen. Amen. Then choose a few people here and there to sit on the, on the thrones next to me, you know. Say that. Three. A lot of that stuff just causes strife, division. Amen. Because everyone's looking at those, those nice seats up there. Yeah. And why does so and so get to sit up there? I've been sitting longer than that person. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, Tell the truth. And that's a reason for strife. See, and so one example is okay, you're in the church. Don't ever say, well, it's got to be okay because. I was at Bishop's Church or this and that church, and they have the big thrones to sit on, the big fancy seats and stuff, and they're up there. No. See, Jesus is talking about he that keeps my word. Amen. See what I'm saying? Amen. Now, you don't have to, you know, 
say that they're, they're the devil and different things like that. Now, you, you know the devil's causing this. But some people are doing it because of a lack of knowledge, because they've seen so-and-so do it. And yeah. sometimes it's just hard to break out of that, out of that tradition. Like I said, there's a new generation of Jesus people rising up <laughs> that aren't going to be fighting over seats in the church. Say that. They're going to be fighting over how many souls they can pray for out there, how many people they can win to Jesus. Yeah. That's what they're going to fight over. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. And so you begin to hold what Jesus said no matter what you see. You know, you might have to go back in the Word again. Now, Jesus, did you really say this? <laughs> if you said this, why are they doing that? So Jesus begins to say, see, this is what I'm talking about. See, then you begin to honor Jesus in that way. He said, he it is that loves me. You become more of a friend to him. See, you're defending what Jesus says then. You know, and it don't matter. You know, we might go to a church as a church and see the same thing. You know, we're not supposed to say, this is wrong. You know, you know, we got to pray that they will also gain an understanding from Jesus. You know? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, there could be seats up there, but when you get these lavish, golden and purple cushion, you know, <laughs> Big, big chairs, and you sit out there, you know. That can allow the spirit of the devil to get in, you know, because pride from the devil is always trying to get in pastors and, 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 and preachers. That's how the devil fell. He desired that seat. He said, I will sit. That's right. In the sides of the north, upon, upon the seat, you know, upon my throne. The devil wanted to sit on the throne of power. That's how he fell. So he tried to get other people to lose out. Yes. He that has my commandments and keep it them, he it is that loves me. He it is that's a friend to me. See, when you begin to hold on to his words, you realize that scripture that says in Romans 3 and 4, it says, yes, let God be true and every man a liar. If, if that's what it comes down to. Amen. You see, you hold on to what Jesus says no matter what anyone else is doing. And, and so you realize you're not trying to line up his words with what you want to teach. But you're choosing to Teach his word above any of man's teachings. You know, a lot of people will will just want to teach about money, for example. So they'll pull scriptures out to try to get to try to back up their message. See, but we're not trying to get the word to back up our message. You can get the scripture to say anything you want it to say. Pull out a few scriptures and you tell some people that don't know the Bible, they'll be like, oh, you know, and people just yeah. go along with stuff. <laughs> yeah. Amen. But you, you don't make a doctrine and then take the Bible and try to back up your doctrine, but you get the doctrine from the Bible. Amen. That's what Jesus wants. You know, guys said. Yeah, you preach the the revelation of the word Amen. with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the revelation of what God is saying, the oracles of God, the living word is coming out of your belly. Yes. And not trying to get the word to back up what you want, what you want to say. Yeah. You want to fit the word, you know, into your own ideas or doctrine. And after that experience, after seeing Jesus more clearly, and what it did also, it opened up the Bible in a way that like was never before. Even though I was a person to study the Bible, keeping the Bible. But you see, Jesus said, I will manifest myself to him that's keeping my word. He saw that I was diligent about his word, you know. 
then that's when he manifests. That word manifest means to appear to. To exhibit in person. Yes. Or to disclose by words. To show. To reveal. So he promised that he would make himself more apparent. See here, I'll pull up this word manifest. Means, well, just like I said, to exhibit in person. He will. He says, "You hold on to my words enough. I'm going to exhibit myself in person. He, he will show himself to you in some way, appear, declare plainly, manifest, show." So. And it opens up the scriptures in an amazing way. You know, when he reveals himself. After you're holding on to his word, and then you can, the scriptures just come alive then. I mean, it's hard to describe, but it just, you know, happens. So since that time now, the Lord, after the Lord told me to preach this message, to let other people know that if they will hold on to my words, I want to manifest myself to them. Yes, yes. See, but the Lord just recently let me know that that word love is the word to be a friend to. To be fond of a person. And so, with that, um, he just began to reveal, and, and, and this will tie into what I'm about to share. But since that time, he began to give me multiple manifestations of him. It seemed like it was just so many, so many times where, I, where, where he appeared to me in different ways now. You know, I can't count the ways because many, uh, many times I would just be in prayer and I would see his face and with seeing his face, I would get a message just from him looking at me, you know. I remember when you remember when the family that was here and and the young man got shot? And when I was in the hospital, you know, the family was there and I and I felt the need to go into an off room and just I was really tired and I wanted just to kind of catch a few minutes of rest. And when I you know I went into this dark room and I set my feet up on the chair. And I wasn't there long, and Jesus appeared to me in a vision. It was amazing. <laughs> now, he had given me a dream about the whole experience that morning, you know, which was amazing. But then he appeared, and then in his, the way he appeared, it was like he, he was giving me a message, everything's going to be okay. But in the natural, it did not look okay. <laughs> Getting shot 16 times, you know. And you're a young little kid like that. Different times and then, not long after that, when he, when me and Mushia were praying, this time in our new bedroom, <laughs> we're at another bedroom though. And when he caught me up, into outer space. And the angel said, stand right here. Jesus wants to meet with you. See, and when he came and he spoke to me out loud and he spoke some blessings over me that still are taking, you know, taking an effect upon me. But that one was very powerful. So experience of him became more frequent. Like when I was praying that, um, in 2016, and all of a sudden I saw the vision, and he came before me like, like in royalty. All of a sudden he zapped me, and I'm looking at him on the cross, and I, I was wide awake at this time. This, this wasn't a dream. I was wide awake. He caught me into this vision, and I'm seeing him literally on the cross suffering. <laughs> that was more personal, you see. See, we're talking about being friends 
to Jesus. I'm trying to lead up to this dream here. <laughs> so stuff, he began to impact me more personally. When I saw him on the cross, I couldn't believe it because and I didn't know he suffered that bad. And all I could see, I was like four feet away, I didn't even see like his hands. I just saw like this part of him, you know. And, and, and he was going back and forth, moving. I could see huge bruises on both sides of his face. And from my position, it looked like he just had a cake blood all on his hair. I, I couldn't see the thorns, but I suppose they were on there. But I just saw like thick blood on, on his hair, bruises, face all messed up. But I noticed, he let me notice through all his uh, beating that... I could see it was him, you know, because I've seen him before. And from that close up, and it touched me, I'm like, you know, to see him in such beauty and, and, and love and then see him like that, it, it, you know, I begin to weep. <clears throat> but he, when he stopped and he just looked at me. <laughs> and then when I, when I came out of the vision, and I heard him speak. He said, teach my people about the power of my blood. You know, and then I, you know, I teach that word in that next Sunday. See, and, and the experience has started getting more personal. Like then, not long ago, I had the dream where I saw him in the clouds. And I saw the angel. But I had been feeling that he wanted me to grow my hair longer. Incidentally, my hair was grown longer. And I went to the barber. I, I told him, don't cut no length off. I just needed trim. You know, it was bushy. I wanted them to trim it so it would look longer. You know, well, once you trim off the bushiness. I don't know. That, that lady cut my hair many times. I, I think the spirit of Delilah got in here for me. <laughs> See, the bad thing with me, I take off my glasses. I take off my glasses when I'm sitting in the chair, so I can't even see clearly to the mirror. I mean, you know, that's how bad my sight is. But I had a feeling she's not doing what I told her. I told her four times, don't cut no length off. No length means no length, you know? <laughs> so I stopped it before she got too into that. <laughs> so in my heart, my hair is still long. <laughs> and it's going to be there before, before I know it, amen? <laughs> See, but I've been wondering. I was feeling very strong because I was walking down the street and I felt the Lord dealing with me, you know? And I, had, and I had to run it by Sister Moshia, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, then I had the dream. And, you know, I, I told you about all about Jesus was up there in the clouds. First, the clouds were kind of shrouded him. Then he stepped out of something in, in living color. And I remember, you know, before he was in, before I could see him clearly, you know what? I forget at what point, but I, but I remember saying, hello, Jesus. <laughs> and he shined from his hand like a star, it looked like, shining, like blinking at me. And then he, he steps forward, and I see his hair. I th and, and, and later on, I realized he was showing me his hair because I was wondering about it. And, you know, from, from the front, it looks like his hair is just down to, like, here, you know. But he went like this, and I could see wavy brown hair that went, it seemed longer than, than what I'm used to seeing. You know, and then he stepped back. And then I noticed the angel, these big wings. It was amazing. The wings were almost as big as the angel. I never saw an angel with wings. And he had long hair, too, when he stepped forward. <laughs> then... I was praying in my house, uh, you know, not, not long after that. And I'm wide awake. I got caught in a living vision. But this vision was most unusual because I saw me standing there. <laughs> 
And my hair was, was much longer, you know. It was like getting to the place where it was before the got a hold of me. I rebuked that spirit. <laughs> Amen. And I had these glasses on, and I saw me, and the Lord took me into my, drew my glasses into my eyes, and when I got through my eyes, I saw Jesus. It was amazing. Amen. So you can see, like, very personal stuff. You know, you, you can talk to your friend about, about your hairstyle, stuff like that. That's something, you know, you would, you would mention to your friends. See what I'm saying? So now let me get into my dream. <laughs> so all these experiences you know and my spirit just getting so blessed by Jesus lately. You know, and, and through these experiences and everything, and just spending time in his word. So about two weeks ago, a little over two weeks ago, I was in a dream with Jesus. And we were sitting on quite a big couch, but it, it wasn't like long, but it was big, you know. Um, really only enough room for, for two people. I mean, you could squeeze in another person if you wanted to. It was one of those, like a big couch for maybe two people and you know, someone could squeeze in there, but it wasn't real long. And I was on his right side and he was on this side, but he was, he was turned towards me, you know, like kind of leaning on the edge of the couch. And we were relaxing on this couch. <laughs> And I remember he was just talking and I was talking back to him and we had a nice conversation. <laughs> then he says, wait. And he kind of stood still. He, he goes, my father wants to speak to me. Like that. And then that was it. The dream was over. And I remember waking up, I'm like, that was amazing. And then now, now this is this is the reason to this. I couldn't remember anything we talked about. He hid it from me. I can't remember anything except the only part I remember is when he said, wait, the father wants to speak to me. So he used this dream and he used it as a piece of like a puzzle. And he brought something together which was just mind-blowing. And when he, um, in the dream, I noticed he was very relaxed, like more relaxed than I've ever seen. Now, when it the time of 2008, he was just joyous, beaming, you know, with joy and everything. This time he was, he was joyful, but the way he was sitting, you know, with his, you know, with his, with his back like leaning up on the side of the couch and talking, he, he seemed like he felt very at ease with me talking to him. And I felt very at ease with him. And it was like we were talking to a good friend. <laughs> I mean, we were talking too. But then, and he let me remember we had a very nice conversation. But then the thing was, why can't I remember anything but the last sentence where he said, wait, my father wants to speak to me. And so this is what he showed me. The next day, or it could have been that morning, I forget. It was that week, brother, the first sister Erica was there. Then her schedule had to change, and then brother Stephen, it, it, it was the week before that. That week, you know, leading up to that Sunday. 
So it turned out with, with Brother Stephen preaching, I didn't have to preach Sunday. So I remember, so after the dream and everything, you know, and I wasn't really thinking about the dream too much, but I asked the Lord, I said, what do you want me to study? Because I don't have to preach, so just tell me what you want me to read or study. And sometimes in those times, I'll read a book from someone who had an amazing experience with Jesus. So usually I'll, I'll look at Anna Roundtree books. They're just so deep. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll open up David E. Taylor's two books. One is Face to Face and the other one on Heaven. Now, there was one on Heaven that I had started reading, and I never finished it. And I hadn't looked at it for about maybe two months. And when I asked him, what do you want me to read? I felt David E. Taylor. Now that first morning, I was like, okay, you know, I, I, I was thinking, I, I was feeling that, but I said, let me read something else, and, and I started reading other scriptures, and then I never got to David and Tim. <laughs> so the next morning came down, you know, and I asked the same thing with, with the Lord. Before I could really ask him, it was just roaring in me, David E. Taylor's book. <laughs> it was nothing else I could do. And I said, okay, so... I have his book on my Kindle app on my phone. You know, it's digital. So when I opened it, I just picked up where I left off reading, which was about two months ago. Let me see if that, I actually got it on here. That maybe we could actually see it and read it together. What I begin to read, which reveals to me about this whole message today. But now, before I read it, though, you know, I always say, we, you know, let me clarify something so every, all the preachers will understand. I always say we shouldn't, like, look at other people's messages to get a message to preach. But, I've always said, if the Lord leads you to, to do something, you go with it. So, it's not wrong to reference someone's book. You know, I just want to clarify it so everyone understands. <laughs> See, what I'm trying to say, don't look at someone else's message because you're too lazy to seek the Lord for yourself. <laughs> but if you're seeking the Lord and he gives you the message and he says, you know, take a look at, at what so-and-so said and quote well, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You see what I mean? <laughs> So the, the wrong thing is, is if you're just sitting back and you got to preach and you're too lazy to pray and wait on God and you say, oh, oh yeah, this looks good, I'll preach this guy's message, you know, that, that would be wrong, but that's not what I'm doing here. <laughs> After some reason, I have it, it's here somewhere, let's see, should, oh wait, let me just, oh, okay, let me.
So remember, this is this is the day after. And the Lord told me to open up this book. Alright. Y'all can see that, right? So this is what I immediately begin to read. Right after remember the 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 next morning the Lord told me to read his book. And I opened it up. I started reading this to sit with the king in his throne is a great honor and was something that Lucifer tried to rob for. Heaven sees this right-hand position as of closeness. Now, when I began to read that, I immediately saw, as I was sitting next to him, I was sitting on his right side. So it says, Heaven sees this right-hand position of closeness as greater than if we were to attain our own personal throne. Better to be at Jesus' right hand than to have our own throne. Remember, this is from his book on heaven. He learned this in heaven. When some of these preachers, now, now he was re referencing Rick Joyner when Rick Joyner went to heaven. I cut some things up so, so we get to the main points. Rick Joyner saw great honored men of God that were known worldwide, you know, back even starting from a uh, hundred years ago, you know, a couple hundred years ago and so, that were not seated in one of these right hand positions in heaven, but they were in a lower position and he began to see like former homeless people and housewives and stuff on these thrones seated at Jesus' right hand. And this is what he's talking about. He said, some of these preachers, when they reached eternity, they occupied some of the lowest places in heaven and did not sit at the right hand of God. Remember, Jesus said, he that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I have overcame and have and sat down with my father in his throne. See, Jesus said that in the book of Revelation. And remember, Jesus is seated at, the, at his right hand. So he says, and did not sit at the right hand of God and make it to the highest calling of God in Christ. This is David saying, as I read this book, I was shocked to hear Rick share that he had seen some of the greatest people and ministers deny the position next to Jesus for all eternity. They still made it into heaven. They just didn't reach the highest place. Some of these ministries and people have impacted the world and won many souls to the Lord, but were denied the next seat to Jesus for all eternity. They didn't make it, and he explains why. They became jealous and threatened by the accomplishments of others. That's one thing we always got to watch out for. We can't say, man, so-and-so's church or ministry seems like they're doing so, you know, they're so much more greater and, you know, and, and things like that. And you begin to compete and you begin to compare and you, and you feel threatened. No, you got to stay focused on Jesus. Amen. See, this is the key. Amen. If you got ten people, you know. <laughs> Amen. You stay focused on Jesus because Jesus wants to prove your heart. Amen. Where you're not gonna go out and do some gimmicks or something, you know, to yeah. to attract people before the time. You know, some people do big advertising and stuff, and they attract too many people before the time, and they're not ready for that kind of people. See, and then a lot of flesh starts coming involved. Better to stay focused with Jesus. That's what he's talking about. Amen. Some operated, operated in insecurity, which caused them to compete with others in ministry. And others failed because of lust, perversion. Now I'm saying we were just talking about this, like, like the other day, you know. Yeah. Lust, perversion, and most of all, because of pride. Yeah. Pride, high-mindedness, and arrogance 
were some of the main reasons many didn't make it. He says, I begin to realize that many who miss the great opportunity to sit next to Jesus. Man, as I'm reading this, God's spirit just came all over me. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe it. I would read one sentence and then just put the book down and just meditate. And I was afraid to look at what he was about to say next. <laughs> he said, I began to realize many who missed this, to sit next to Jesus for all eternity did so because they didn't walk in love or remain devoted to Jesus alone. We got to remain devoted to him. That's what Jesus was talking about. He that has my commandments and keeps them. He it is that's my friend. You see? The most unlikely people here on earth who are despised and overlooked are honored and glorious in heaven because of their humility and love. Isn't that something? You know, and this is what what we've been preaching for a long time because of the revelation of Jesus. Because I saw his humility and love. And I know that there's no way we could be proud in Jesus' home. <laughs> that we could be mean in Jesus' love. You see what I'm saying? There were still many vacant seats next to Jesus that could have been filled in any generation, but they remained empty. I ask you now, beloved reader, will you be one of them? Anyone reading this book can sit in this place of honor, but you must pursue him, not fame, a huge ministry or success. Not pursue fame, a huge ministry or success. Just him. He alone must be your focus. Never deviate from loving Jesus with all your heart, body, mind, and soul is the key. Isn't that deep? <laughs> you too, look at this, can have the place of closeness, closeness seated next to Jesus at God's right hand. And that's why, you know, I, I begin I begin to get blown away because here, me and him were seated right next to each other talking as friends. You see that? Paul encourages us in Colossians to look forward to and seek after heavenly things instead of setting our affections and aspirations on earthly material things. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Where do we look to? To the right hand where Christ sits, which is a place of friendship. See that? Which is a place of friendship, closeness, and the highest level of intimacy that we can have with the Lord Jesus and his Father. See, and, and to me, the pieces of the puzzle were just, I mean, God was using different things to confirm and then when Brother Stephen came, and he gave us a, a, a word. Remember when he called me and Sister Moshia? And one of the things he said is, he said, I will talk to the set man of this house even as I talk with Moses. Mm. Yes. Yes. Here, I'm going to pull my notes out for you now. <laughs> So you can see the confirmations of what God wanted me to reveal today about this dream. And when, when he said, I will talk to the same man, even as I talk with Moses, this anointing almost knocked me over. <laughs> and that word was just so confirming in everything, you know. The harvest from the seeds that, that we've been planting and the work we've been doing. And we've been nothing but planting seeds every week consistently out, out here. Okay. 
Now we'll close with this one scripture. And this is actually more of a confirmation that blew me away. Just three days ago, the Lord led me into this scripture here in John 15. And I did not know what the scripture said. He said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You are my friends. You are my associates, companions, brothers. If you do whatsoever I command you. Now, now look at this. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. Now look at this part that just hit me so hard. If, if you remember in the dream when we were talking and he said, wait, the father wants to speak to me. And he said here, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father. I have made known unto you. <laughs> I mean, you got that. That was amazing. See, it, it was like a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. He made me read David E. Taylor's book. Yeah. And then he brought me back to the scripture. And that's why he let me remember. That was the only thing he said. Wait, my father wants to speak to me. See, when you're his friend, he will make known all things to you that the father tells him. And he wanted me to share this today. <laughs> so that everyone here, not only here, but on Facebook, YouTube, whatever, can pursue in a deeper way a friendship with Jesus by holding on to his words no matter what, holding on to Jesus, focusing on him no matter. Don't compare yourself. If you're a preacher, don't compare yourself with other preachers. Compare yourself to Jesus. Don't try to be like other preachers. Try to be like Jesus. You can take examples from good preachers. You know, you can learn a lot from preachers. But Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. <laughs> Don't compare yourself with other ministries, other, other preachers, or what people are doing. Focus on Jesus. Put your attention on heaven. Let, let, let Jesus, let the Holy Ghost from heaven inspire you. He gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to teach us all things. And if we pursue Jesus, we will become his friends. That's And what, what David E. Taylor said, which God revealed him, that's the closest place of, of, that signifies the closest place of friendship and intimacy. And of course, it's not the physical act where you get to sit next to him. Now, he'll let you sit next to him. That's what I experienced in the dream. It wasn't on his throne, unless his throne is a big couch. I don't know. <laughs> but the thing I remember, we were talking as friends. And then when he brought his father into the subject, then this scripture cleared it all up for me. I like Jesus. Thank you so much. And I feel very strongly, you know, I mean, this is, I share my, my, my personal journey that I'm on every day with Jesus. But he, he gave me these revelations, not just to bless my soul abundantly, which he does every day, <laughs> but to try to help anyone who will hear know that there is a place with Jesus that's not, it's not about how people see you. It's not about, you know, like if you're in the ministry, it's not about how you can impress people with anything. It's about, is Jesus impressed with your love? See, that's what it's about. There's people who can even begin to operate in a false anointing and see miracles and healings. 
Because Jesus said in that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Done many wonderful works, cast out devils, and Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. We weren't friends. I, I, I didn't know you. You see what I'm saying? We weren't close. You were just using my name, and you got a false anointing on me. You see? So it's not about proving yourself through signs and wonders, but when you are following Jesus, there will be signs and wonders, amen? <laughs> there will be healings. There will be miracles. Demons will come out. But we want to do it in unity, in union with Jesus, the Lord working with us, Jesus among us. Saints, let's lift our hands to him right now. We thank you, Jesus.